This is a Talk Station original podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Senior Moment. You've got myself, Ryan Kelly, and Lynn Schultz from Carter at Landing. Lynn, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm Thank glad you. to hear that. And you have another exceptional guest lined up for us today. So uh, continuing on, our last guest had been a uh, death doula and learning about the passing process. We're going to continue with that theme today and that we have Gentiva Hospice here to discuss about what hospice services are, and Natalie Gibble will be joining us to talk about it. So, Natalie, thank you. Welcome for, welcome to, to our podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. I've always said there's so much more to hospice, but everybody's initial response when they hear hospice is, oh my gosh, that means I'm dying tomorrow. Exactly, yes. Tell us tell us about that myth. <laughs> so the myth behind that, a hospice is caring for people with life-limiting illness that if the illness reaches its normal progression, they typically have six months or less to live. Life-limiting illness such as your congestive heart failure, end-stage chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, Alzheimer's, you know, a lot of people think hospice is for just cancer patients that, you know, are foregoing treatment. And that's that's not so. We have patients on hospice with all kinds of different diagnoses that are declining that have decided, you know, I'm tired of going to the hospital. I'm tired of going to the doctor. I just I just want to be home and enjoy whatever time I have left with my family members and those that I love the most. We do have patients on hospice. I know everybody knows former president Jimmy Carter. They did a big segment on him this year. He has been on hospice for a year, over a year now. So hospice is for those, like I said, with life-limiting illness of six months or less, but you can have patients that are on longer as long as they continue to show decline and are determined to be appropriate we can keep them on service now sometimes they will graduate they will stabilize they won't decline you know for a while and when I say decline you know not eating falling a lot altered mental status, different things like that. You know, that if when we see those things, they're eating less or they're not eating at all. Those type things we consider decline. If they are still eating three meals a day, 100% of the meals, I mean, if they're out in Walmart and shopping and, you know, and doing great, they graduate. But That doesn't mean one and done. You can come off of hospice services. And down the line, you know, if that illness begins to progress and you begin to decline again, you can come back on hospice. We had a resident at the nursing home that I trained to be an administrator at that was on hospice. I want to say it was more than two years that he was on hospice. And so it certainly isn't a, a, a saying that get on hospice and your loved one or you are going to pass away next week it's yeah. as you said it's a it's a it's it's a real benefit and so mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about what are some of the benefits of being on hospice so hospice is a benefit that is a hundred percent covered by a patient's medicare part a benefit it covers nursing so our company at minimum you're going to have two nursing visits a week it could be two RNs, it could be an RN visit, an LPN visit. We typically have a home health aide that will come in and help with those ADLs, the activities of daily living, showering, bathing. They typically start out coming in two to three times a week. We have a chaplain that provides spiritual support, and then we have a social worker that is a plethora of information and resources that kind of come in and offer support for the family as well. Some of the things they do, you know, if a family member, the patient doesn't have a POA and is, 
you know, interested in doing that, she can help navigate or he can help navigate with those type things. Final arrangements, they can kind of help navigate those things. And they're just there to as extra support to love on the family. You know, it's hard being a caregiver. I have personal experience being that caregiver, being that family member. And it, it's hard. It's it's an emotional roller coaster. We're not meeting these patients at their best time. You know, they've been faced with a a devastating prognosis or diagnosis and, you know, everybody's reeling and then you're thinking, Oh my gosh, what comes to next? What do what do I do? You know, and so having all of those extra people involved. Once the patient passes We offer bereavement support for up to 13 months after a patient passes. We're still supporting that family through the grief process. And as someone who has experienced loss with a family member on hospice versus someone who has lost a parent that it was sudden, we didn't have hospice, you know, I needed that grief counseling, and I had to pay for it out of pocket. Whereas if we would have been able to go through and know that, you know, my mom was sick and she was passing, that is support that I would have been able to continue to have, you know, after she passed for up to a year after she passed. So those are just some of the benefits of hospice. A lot of people think of the hospice house in this area, but do you have to be in a facility to receive hospice services? You do not. We meet families and patients where they are, whether that's at home. A vast majority of people want to be at home, and that's wherever they call home. You know, they could be in an assisted living facility like your place. That's their home. That's where they want to be. And our goal is to keep them there. If we want them comfortable, and and they're comfortable at home. We have patients in skilled nursing facilities, So, no, they don't necessarily have to go to the hospice house. There are things that's called a GIP, a general inpatient contract. There are hospitals that allow hospice agencies to come in and provide hospice support to the patient in the hospital. So it it can be a lot of different places. It's not necessarily at the hospice house. And I know it's a great great tool for Carteret Landing just because... Our goal is to have our our residents have end of life in our building Mm -hmm. because it's home. It becomes home. home. So for hospice to come in is just a a fabulous tool to help us do that. And it, it helps because we're there offering that extra support at end of life. You know, it takes... It takes some of the weight off of your staff that you have, you know, with your, you know, home health aides and nurses. We're able to provide that extra support and really work as a team to provide the best care for these patients at end of life. Jumping more from the benefits and more to the personal side of hospice, Mm -hmm. how would you suggest people have that conversations with their loved ones about whether or not we should bring in hospice? I know that, I mean, that's a conversation that we have at our community on a regular mm-hmm. basis. Yep. But for somebody who isn't experienced with that, how how would, as a son or a daughter, would you suggest broaching the subject with their parents about hospice services? So me being a, as a child, I mean, I'm an adult, but I'm a child, and my dad has one of these life-limiting illnesses. For me, when you get to the point, if that, parent is declining going to the hospital a lot experiencing a lot of hospitalizations or er visits things like that that is when in my mind the time comes if okay it's it's time to have this conversation i would approach it because they're going to give you cues you're going to hear them say i don't want to go to the hospital i'm tired of going to the hospital i'm tired of treatment whatever that treat you know if it's a cancer patient I'm I'm tired of chemo I'm tired of radiation and that's kind of what we faced with my mother-in-law was she was at that point I'm tired and so we were just very frank and we were like okay what does this look like to you where do you want to go from here and and she said I just I want to go home and so from that 
we reached out and and Jen Tiva came in and met with us and was able to give information about the services and we left it up to her and she made the decision and as a family member you know you can provide the resources and talk to them but at the end of the day it it, everybody has to agree i know um, personally my grandmother was on hospice when she passed away and i it was down in florida but it was an incredible benefit to be able to have that as a help um you know it Mm -hmm. it had that extra people checking on her and she was in an assisted living community there and Mm -hmm. it really was just uh, a really good experience now i think this is a a really good time to take a break after the break i'd like to talk to you a little bit about how you got into this field because it really takes a special type of person to be able to do so so i'll share my why with that that's perfect that'd be great Hi, this is Lynn Schultz at Carteret Landing. We invite you to visit our beautiful assisted living community. Carteret Landing pairs exceptional, compassionate senior care with the stylings of a resort. Our beautifully appointed suites, common areas, and bright and engaging memory care neighborhood can provide you or your loved one with the quality living they deserve. Carteret Landing is in Moorhead City, right behind the Friendly Market. Come by and see us today or call for your personal tour at 252-773-0980. My name is Holly Fisher from Let's Go In Wellness, and you're listening to Senior Moment. And we're back with the Senior Moment. Lynn Schultz and myself, Ryan Kelly from Carter at Landing, and Natalie Gibble from Gentiva Hospice. Um, and so, you, you can't, we, or our, our listeners can't see it, but you have a pin on that says why. And it kind of reminds me of, I think it's Simon Sinek's Find Your Why. Mm-hmm. Tell us about your pin and, and tell us about um, what I'm assuming is, is your why and why you do this. All right. So this week is kind of our why week. It's kicking off. We're going to be doing Customer Appreciation Week starting next week and so we were challenged by our powers that be to really think about why what motivates us each day to get up and go to work and and work in hospice because we're not meeting people at the best times of their lives we're meeting patients and families that have been given a devastating prognosis and and so you know really think about the why what what drives you each day and so for me my why is i do have personal experience with hospice i i know what it's like to be that family member or close friend that has been given you know faced with that devastating prognosis and and okay where do we go from here and you know we brought hospice in with my grandparents we brought hospice in with my mother-in-law and to be loved on and supported the way we were through hospice I don't know that we would how we would have survived that loss of either my grandparents or my mother-in-law and we truly felt loved and supported and you know we kind of knew what to expect from day to day week to week so we were not going in blind or being lost not knowing what to expect and so that is my why I want every family or patient that I come in contact with to feel that love and support that I felt in that devastating time and so that's my why that's what i get up and go to work for every day and and just educating you know there's a huge stigma around i say the dreaded h word you know and i just i want to provide education and say you know hospice isn't a bad word it's not a bad thing and and this is how we can love on you and support you at this time in your life you know so that's my why, and that's why I'm wearing my button. You led into over the, during the break. You mentioned um, some statistics regarding how few people use their use mm-hmm. their hospice, and you you know you're talking about 
the dreaded H word of being hospice. Do you think that that's, can you, can you share with the listeners some of those statistics and, and do you think it's because of the stigma that goes with hospice? I absolutely do. So I attended some training back in March in Atlanta. We have a corporate office in Atlanta. We also have one in Mooresville, North Carolina. And um, some statistics were thrown out, at, and I was flabbergasted. The first statistic that was thrown at us was 100% of Medicare patients that are hospice appropriate. Out of, a, out of that 100, only 46% are using their hospice benefit. So that means 54% of those that are appropriate that are on Medicare are dying at home or are dying at the hospital. Families don't have that extra support. That is staggering to me. The average hospice stay today is 18 days. Now remember I told you hospice is for patients with life-limiting illness that haven't expected six months or less. So six months, 30 days, let's say 180 days is the typical only 18 days. 18 days. In my worst time, you know, you're facing this terrible loss of a spouse or a parent, a brother, sister, whomever, a best friend, whomever that may be. Are you going to feel comfortable grieving or being devastated around someone that you just met two or three days ago? Or are you going to feel more comfortable around that person that you now feel like is family and you've met and and have come to know and love in you know, three months, four months, five months. So to me, that's the devastating part about people not taking the gift of hospice earlier rather than later because, you know, I don't. I don't want a stranger Mm -hmm. hugging on me, you know. So, I mean, it's just, I just feel like families get impatience, just have such a disservice when they don't truly get their benefit. Or the extended benefit afterwards. Mm-hmm. And um, yep. the support comes in afterwards. Absolutely. Absolutely. What type of, um, for hospice, I do you supply any of the supplies? Does hospice um, help out with that? We do. So I'm glad you asked that. Um, yes. So those patients, um, once they come on hospice, um, hospital bed, um walkers wheelchairs um incontinent supplies you will see that a lot near end stage alzheimer's they become incontinent of bowel and bladder and it's like having a little one and having to buy diapers again they're expensive Mm -hmm. and um and can be a burden on families so those are um, items that are covered through the hospice benefit got it that's that's wonderful and that can be a really, definitely a help. Yeah, it's, right. it can definitely be a really, really good financial help mm-hmm. for families as well. I know. I mean, as you mentioned, the for our, for residents that are living with our within our community, one of the biggest benefits is the is getting a hospital bed, mm-hmm. being able to to have some of that equi- medical equipment brought mm-hmm. in that just makes it that much easier to take care of someone and that much safer for that person mm-hmm. themselves. I Absolutely, mean, it's really, it it really does help out a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I, my opinion is, of course, one of the one of the best ways to educate people and to maybe take some of that stigma away is is by having people who have had good experiences sharing sharing those experiences with other families. And so, what's some of the feedback that you get from the families who have utilized your services? Um, and and I mean, I know you can you can work with them for up to 13 months after their loved mm-hmm. one pass away. So I'm sure that some of those conversations continue to happen. What what do you get for feedback from families? So we have actually in the last several months have gotten several Google reviews. So patients and families can use Google. Um, and we also is part after is we um, we send out surveys Um, We send out surveys to providers. We send out surveys to families, you know, to truly ask them, you know, 
about their visits, about their experience. Where can we improve? Do we need to improve? What do we do great? What do we do not so great? And so that's kind of how we get our feedback. And and we depend on those, you know, those Google reviews and, and answering those surveys and sending those surveys back in. And like I said, I mean, we send them to our providers as well, you know. So. And from the from the surveys and from the reviews, what do the families highlight as as kind of their what they say was the most beneficial part of having their loved one on hospice? The support, the the support from our team, whether you know the nursing, the chaplain, um, the social workers being there and and feeling supported. Um, it it's such a devastating time for them knowing that they have someone there. Um, hospice is a 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So if you have a crisis in the middle of the night with that patient, you call us and, and somebody's going to be there to help deal with that crisis. And so just knowing that you have that support, um, and that you're not alone. Um, our speed to care, we get a lot of compliments on that. Um, for instance, for me, when I when I get a referral, you hand me a referral, say, Natalie, here, we have this referral, this patient's ready for hospice. I make contact with that family within an hour, and I try to meet with them same day. Um, we strive to admit same day and we do have a goal of admitting within three hours. You know, does it always happen? Is every, not always because, you know, you, it depends on what that day looks like. You may already have several admissions scheduled for that day. Um, but we're going to do our best. We're going to get you there, you know, within a day or so. So that is one thing is, um, whether it's weekends we admit on a weekend, just like we do during the week. It's not, you know, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we do get complimented on that a lot for our speed to care and how fast we are to react and, and to get that patient on. I've noticed as well, um, when a family gets with you and decides hospice is the right way to go, it's not far after that all the equipment starts showing up. So It does. Um, it's 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 a pretty mm-hmm. quick turnaround. Which and- we take that off of the families. We do mm-hmm. that. We get the equipment ordered. You know, they will call the family to set up delivery of that equipment. But that is, we take that burden off of the families. If there's one message that you'd like people to remember from listening to this podcast regarding hospice, what what would be that one message? The one message, um, let's remove the stigma around hospice hospice you don't have to actively be dying today tomorrow um let us be there to support your family earlier versus later hospice isn't a bad thing we just want to love on you and support you in your final journey and let us be able to do that I think that's a great thing for people to remember is that is that it is it's and it's a journey and it's funny that this is a room full of people who have had family members utilize hospice Mm -hmm. and I think that it's all a great uh, I mean I think we can all support the mission of hospice it's a it really is a wonderful service and I want to thank you for coming on the radio show or the podcast today and um, and sharing that message and uh, thank you all for listening.